Hey everyone, welcome to a video for Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards. Um, any games from this series will contain uh, explicit content, gore, um, sexual content, violence, language, um, all the bad stuff that you know, you're not supposed to like or enjoy. Um, so if that stuff offends you, please turn off the video now. Again, there is a warning for awesome, mature content and profanity. Um, any of these videos in this series will have these. Um, there is no way around it in showing off the content. Therefore, again, if this stuff offends you at any point or before you watch the video, please turn it off rather than complain about it. Um, that is your final warning. Thank you. Bye. Hey everyone, it's Jason, and welcome to Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards. Uh, this is a video where I'm going to show the basic gameplay, like, setup, and how to play the game for the various spell crafting games. Um, now each game, uh, this is one, two, three, four, and five, and there's a sixth one on the way, um, before I have this video out. Um, have the basic, same basic gameplay, uh, setup, how turns work, cards, how all that functions. Each game does add a little extra thing to it, uh, like the core game just has the base stuff, um, but then uh, some of the games have ex they started adding extra cards or different types into the sets as the sets went on, as well as um, uh, like uh, number five here, Hell High has a social standing board, uh, Pleasure Panic has special tokens, uh, Murder Shroom Marsh has um, some other different, uh, component stuff. So each one adds its own extra little element to the game, which will be described more in depth in the unboxings for those videos. So if you want to know more about each game individually, check out the unboxing for them. This is just to show off the basic of the game. So what is the game itself? What you are doing is you are going to play as one of the wizard champions that come in the various boxes. Um, so each set can come from anywhere from 7 to 10 different characters. And what they're going to function as are your health. Um, so this is the character you're playing as and you are casting spells and you are crafting spells. Which is why it's a spell crafting game. Um, so you start with 20 health and your goal is to defeat other characters by eliminating their health down to 1. Uh, but in this game, death is temporary. After you die, um, you will come back and you will play again. Um... And this will keep being, uh, keep going on and on. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into that when I get to that aspect of the game. Uh, so what are you actually doing then in the game is you are creating spells you're going to have. Your deck of cards here. Um, and then on the, each card is going to have different setups and you're actually going to be building spells. So you put them together and you make these, ugh, sorry, make these scenes of... Three different things. There's yellow bordered cards, which are sources, uh, middle cards, which are quality, and right side cards, which are delivery, which are red. Um, and you build spells, and they do different things based on what order and what you do. That's the gist of the game. Um, how do you win? You can win in one of two different ways. Um, so as you're playing through the game, every time you defeat um, an opponent, um, if you're the last player left alive, everyone else has been defeated, you're going to draw a last wizard standing token. Um, which has some of them, some of the later sets have a one on the back to keep track that it's worth one point. Um, so then it ends up with two different ways to play. Either you play the uh, epic variant or it's the base game, the starter rules were before they change them, is you play until one player has won two tokens. So each person could win one game, and then it's whoever wins the second game essentially wins the overall game. Or, the updated rules is you play um, with every time you kill a wizard, you also get one of those little tiny kill tokens as well. And then if you're the last player standing, you get this, and you play three full rounds. Therefore, then at the end of three rounds, whoever has the most points wins. Um, those are the two basic ways to play. So it's either playing until... Someone wins two. Someone wins two games, or you play three full rounds, and then whoever has the most points wins the overall game. Um, 
but like most of these games, you could play longer and longer if you want and have more and more things. Um, that's the idea of it. So I'm going to show you setup quick. Uh, one moment. All right. So this is a basic setup for any of the games you're going to play. Um, again, each one's going to have extra little components. So they might have an additional board or pile of tokens that you'll have to have somewhere else on the board but roughly this is how every game will start you'll have your main deck of cards here um so this is the deck that everybody shares everyone uses the same thing and then as you play through games and you utilize stuff you'll start a discard pile um you don't want to reshuffle any of the decks um until after they unless they run out that way you have options to get through every card in a set um then the second deck we have here are treasure decks. There are various cards you're going to get throughout the game, which will get you treasures, which will get you these special different gold cards, um, which you get to utilize until you die unless you have a special ability on them. Um, then the final deck of cards are the dead wizard cards. So if you die during the during a game, you get to draw one of these cards for every turn that you're dead. Um, and we'll go over that a little bit more when we get to that. And that's just what the idea of those are, is to keep you in the game, and that way if you get eliminated early on, in the next round you actually have a benefit of starting. Um, and I have my three different player wizard cards. Now, granted, if we're playing the game, we don't have to have them this close. We're probably going to want to be spread a little bit more. I only have so much camera space. So... And on each card, they're going to have spot number 20 for their health, which will be a white colored or a different colored token. And you start with a little skull in there to show your health. Every time you take damage, you move your counter down. You gain health, you go up. You can go up to 25. And once you hit your bottom row, it means you're almost dead. And once you go off of one, it is game over. Um, now, these characters, again, are just for... They're called wizard champions. They are just for basically keeping track of health in this game. Uh, you can go ahead and portray or pretend that you're going to be that character if you want to be hogged to the house. You can act, you know, play, role play that if you'd like. But for the purpose of the game, that's what they're there for. Um, so then on the back of each book, they do have a what to do on each turn. Um, so it says, at the start of each turn, each wizard draws from the main deck until... He or she has a full hang of eight cards. And then each dead wizard draws a dead wizard card. Alright, so then what we're going to do is we each draw a hand of eight cards. Which will get us a bunch of different cards here. Uh, then what we're going to want to do is create our spells. So create a spell. Each wizard plays up to three different types of her spell, uh, spell components uh, face down in front of him or her. Um, so what you want to do is then pick out a set. Now I'll go over the details of each of these cards in a minute. But what you want to do is pick three cards that are going to go together. Now you can only have one of each of the borders. See, they have a border on the outside. You only have one of each side. So you can have, or they're going to be the colors in the bottom. The source, the delivery, and the quality. Um, you can only have one of each. So you can have a spell that is one card. You can have a spell that's two cards. Or you can have a spell that is all three cards um and when you play them they want you to place them face down like so so like that's my hand this is princess's hand and the genie will have his hand over here now the rule book does show them spread out um you could spread them out if you want um, the reason why you'd want to put them into a stack is so that your opponent doesn't know if you're playing one card or three cards. Um, and the idea is that when everybody has them, you are going to start resolving your spells. So now we have turn order. So as each wizard announces how many components are in his or her spell, wizards who play one card go before wizards who play two. And we just you have two go before we just you play three. So if you only play one or two, you get to act quicker. But it also means your spell is going to have less abilities on it. So there's the up and down side of it. You'll get to go first um, or maybe second. But you're not going to get to do as many things. Um, this can be very beneficial. If my health was down at five, I might only want to play one card. So I can hopefully at least get to act. If I play three, I might act last, and I could end up dying before my spell actually goes off. Um, and so we find out about that. It says, 
Uh, the higher your deliveries initiative, the sooner you act. Um, so then on the back side of the delivery cards, we have these little uh, fire orbs. So this one says 11. So the higher your number, the... Uh, uh, the higher the number, the quicker you get to go. Um, so that way, like, an 11 is going to go after the 13 here. Now, if you didn't play a card with a delivery, you're considered to have zero, so you will go last. So, um, if you play... So, if I had two, two characters, so if I played a two-card spell that was uh, just my source and quality... Sorry, my camera keeps going out of focus. And I have no delivery. I have no initiative number. I am considered zero. So if another player also played a two-card spell, but theirs was, for example, these two, they would have a higher initiative. They would go before my two cards. Um, that's basically how it's figured out. Now, I would recommend the first few times, even first games, but especially the first round or so, first couple of hands, don't spend your time, your time um, in your first couple of times playing or if you're teaching someone new. Don't spend a lot of time looking at each card trying to devise a super strategy. Just pick three cards, one of each, play them down, see what happens. You'll get the feel for how the game works. Um, then you can go through and start, start determining strategies after you understand how things work. Because you can try and plan something out. Um, I'm going to target this player. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But if somebody acts before you, um, they can easily destroy your plans. So that's why you don't want to spend a ton of time. Then to resolve a spell. Read the name of your spell in a wizard voice. Resolve the effects of your card in order. Source, quality, then delivery. So left to right. Um, Alright, so then let's say we're going to start our turn out. All players here have three cards. So we're just going to flip all three over and see what we have. Um, alright, so, my character here, Hodge of the House, has the Death Spirits Devilish, uh, Gornado, which has an initiative of two, so I'm probably going to attack last. Um, the Princess Holiday has, uh, Dr. Root Barky's, uh, Mighty Grow Fisco Nature, which has an initiative of 14. And Zanzibar the Genie here has Wormators, uh, Explodifying, Packed with the Devil, which has an initiative of 18. So, by that number, so since we all have three, he has 18, he's going to go first. Uh, Princess will go second, and I will go third. My Hogs of the House will go third. Uh, so, how do you resolve these spells? You're going to look at them at each card as a separate thing. So if we're playing Worminator, it's going to say, um, I deal one damage to each foe for each different glyph in your spell. The glyphs will be these little numbers on the bottom. Um, so there's, there's different things like that. So actually, before we get into the turns, let's go over what's on each card. Alright, so we're going to look at the individual stuff on each type of card before we actually show how they all work. So, um... First of all, we have a card with a left border, nothing on the right. These are our source cards. They are starting cards. They are um, essentially like a wizard or whoever is casting this spell. Now, yes, you're playing as a wizard champion, but you're so powerful, you summon minions to do your bidding for you. So in this case, we're summoning Blue Max's Brainiac. This is an Arcane spell. There are five different types of of glyphs in the game. Arcane, Dark, Elemental, Illusion, and Primal. Each one, um, as you play through, will realize they kind of have a um, theme to them. So Arcane cards like to hurt foes. They like to gain you treasures. Uh, dark cards, usually um, you do tons of extra damage, but it costs you. Elementals usually have lots of... Um, they do a lot. They maybe do less damage, but they do it to more, more creatures, or they'll have really big effects. Uh, illusions, you get a lot of stuff where you get to play around with swapping cards out or moving things around. And Primal, um, likes to do stuff about healing or doing, uh, damage to multiple characters. So you kind of get a couple of different things in there. Um, and the, you know, generally as itself, the Glyph doesn't do anything. 
um, but it is referenced in different cards. The second type of card we have are quality. This is a some sort of adjective defining what type of spell we're casting. Now it'll have an orange on the top and bottom, but nothing on the sides. It's the center card. This one happens to be a primal. And then on the third one, we have the delivery, which has the right border with no left side, which are red. Um, and this will be the name of the spell, uh, which will have your initiative. Also have another glyph. Um, so let me put them all together. That means we have Bleemax, Brainiax, per Prickly, Exorcism. Now, if you play a card that's smaller um, than that, so if we play, we could play Bleemax, Brainiax, Exorcism. So I just have a simple Exorcism spell. It's not Prickly. Um, or we could have um, Bleemax, Brainiax, Prickly. Now, if you play a card like that that doesn't have a source or delivery, you're missing a part. The game recommends you just adding something. So, Bleemax, Brainiacs, Prickly, you know, uh, and then you just add what type of thing, like Blast, or Explosion, or Murder Storm, you know, whatever you want to call it. In the same idea, you do the other direction. So, if I had Prickly Exorcisms, you could use either a made-up wizard or the wizard you're playing as. So, if I'm playing Hogs of the House, I could say Hogs of the House Prickly Exorcism. Um, and that's just stuff they want you to do to kind of be thematic. Uh, whether you do that or not, that is entirely up to you. It's not going to affect the game one way or the other. Um, so then the other big thing in the game are these roll for powers. Um, so some spells are going to have targets. They'll target a foe, which is anybody but you. Um, some will target foes on left, some will target foes on your right, some will target stronger foes, which are anybody that has more health than you. Someone might target the strong S, which is whoever has the most health, or they might be weak, the weaker foes, or weak S, which are uh, any other player that has less health, or weak S being the least amount of health. Um, there's also stuff that might be random, which is different ways, however you want to decide a random amount. Um, and that's the thing is this can change, uh, from game to game. Because I could be choosing to target a foe on my right, but then if somebody else plays before me, um, that person might get eliminated and might be targeting a different person on my right. Um, or if I'm targeting the strongest foe and be before I get to actually attack, that foe might change. Um, so there's different things like that that can happen. Then we have roll for power. So that's what we'll have some dice for. So what you're going to do in a roll for power is actually determine, uh, rolling a die is going to decide what you get. So if I roll one die, I got a two, I deal one damage. How do I get more dice? You have more glyphs in your spell. Um, so like here, in our spell here, we had an arcane, a primal, and a dart. Since none of these match, I would only get a roll one die for each. So I do Blue Max's effect, I do Prickly's effects, I roll one die for that, and if I had Exorcism, I roll one die for that. Now, if I had a second, um, which I, of course I'm probably not going to draw one because I'm looking for it. If I had a second Dark or Primal Glyph in there, I would get a roll two dice, which would make it easier to get to the five or nine. If I had all three of the same Glyph, I would get a roll more. So having same Glyph spells can potentially get you higher power rolls um but maybe you want to get something they're usually better effects um but not all the time um but you also might some cards do better if you have different glyphs and different things you have to start eventually reading all of them like i said the first time through you could probably skip them other things to point out on some of the cards um Alright, now that we've uh, saw what all the different things we're going to do, we're going to actually play through a round here. And then I will go over some of the other additional uh, rules or card types that have been they're added after the original base game. So, we start with Wormitator here. It says, deal one damage for each, for each bow for each different glyph in my spell. I have two elementals and a dart, so I only have two damage. So, one for the elemental, even though it's doubled, and then one for dart. So that means Hog the House would take one damage, uh, takes two damage, and 
Uh, the princess would take two damage, and being that I am Zanzibar for this turn, I would not take any damage. Then we flip over to our next spell. It says Explodifying. Target foe of my choice. So now, right now, both players have the same amount of health, so I can decide which one I'd want to attack first. I could decide, hey, maybe I want to try it you know, this early on. It probably doesn't make a big difference, but later it might be the difference between eliminating a player or not. Um, uh, so it might make sense, you know, for me, like, in this time, I'm going to attack Hodge the House. Since he's going to attack last, is it maybe between myself and Princess we can eliminate him? So it says, roll for power. I get to roll one die for each glyph I have. I have two elemental, so I will get to roll two dice. So we rolled a sweet. We rolled 11. So 11 is going to get us, says, deal four damage and choose and destroy one of that foe's treasures. Well, he doesn't have any treasures early in the game, but he takes four more damage. So one, two, three, four. So he's down to 14 health. Um, then we have... Uh, pack with the devil, your strongest foe. Uh, so this would be the foe with the most hit points that is um, not just the most overall hit points, but whoever has the most amongst whoever I am fighting. So at this point now, I don't get to attack Holiday the house again. I have to be forced to attack Princess Holiday. Now, if this would have hit before when they were equal, I could choose which one I wanted to do. Now I'm going to roll for power again, but I only have one dark glyph, so I only get to roll one die. So we rolled another 6. So that does our 5 to 9. So it's 2 damage. Now if I had rolled the 10, I could have got 2 damage. And if they had a delivery in their spell, I could steal it and resolve it. So now this would have been a good thing if I was paying attention in my hand. If I had another dark, I probably would have benefited more from playing a second dark than playing 2 elementals. But, you know, sometimes maybe you don't have one or who knows. Now all these cards go to my discard pile. And she took 2 damage. Alright, so that's the end of Zanzibar's turn. Then we go over to Princess Holiday's turn. Who starts off with... Um, Dr. Rudy Barks. You heal 3 HP. Each bow rolls a die. Each bow who rolls a 6 heals 3 HP. Well, first let's heal our 3 HP. Puts us back up to 19. So, Zanzibar's gonna roll a die. He rolls a 2. That doesn't get him anything. And then Hogs will roll 1 and he rolled a 1. So neither player benefited from that. So that worked out for me. I got an extra 3 health out of it. Um, then we have Mighty Grow. I get a heal 2 HP. Then if you are the weakest player, add a random card to your hand from your spell. Well, if I heal 2, to put me up actually to 21, which is above my starting health, I am no longer the weakest player. Um, now, if Zanzibar had rolled a 6 and got 3 HP... I still wouldn't have been the weakest because Hodge the House would have been. There's no way he would have gotten enough health. Um, so that's kind of one of the downsides of playing this like this particular spell maybe early on. Because I have no chance of probably getting um, being lower. But having the extra HP did help me. Then finally we have Fisto Nature. So I get to roll three because I have three primals in my spell. So three dice should pretty much guarantee I get high. But it doesn't always. We got uh, 12. Because you could roll three ones or three twos, which would be six. Um, so we get to do 10 damage to my foe on my left. Sorry, not three damage. Four damage to the foe on my left. So that's Hodge the House. So one, two, three, four. So that puts him down to half health. And I discard my hand. Um, yeah, so right now at the end of the first two players going. Hogs of Health is already down to 10 health. Uh, Zanzibar is still at 20. And Princess Holiday is at 21. So you can see how much the game changed over the course of three cards being played. So then finally Hogs of the House gets to go. He's going to start with Death Fairies. Deal 2 damage to any foe if that foe dies repeat this effect. Well clearly this was a bad card to play on my first turn because no one is going to die. But again, maybe other cards in my hand weren't as good, or maybe I didn't have anything else. But I can deal two damage to any foe, so I can decide who do I want to deal damage to. Well, let's deal damage to Princess, since she has the most health. Then we have Devilicious, a target full of my choice. Um, I can roll for power. So I have only two Dark Glyphs in my spell. I Before I roll, I have to choose. We're going to choose the Princess again. And we rolled an 8. 
So an eight is going to just four damage, but then I take one damage. So I'll put me back down to nine, but she takes four damage. So one, two, three, four. And then finally we have Gornado, your strongest foe, which is going to be Zanzibar. So unfortunately, I don't get to do any more damage to the princess, and I only get one glyph, or uh, one die roll. So we roll one, we rolled a five, which is not bad at all. We did deal three damage. So one, two, three. So therefore, at the end of round one, nobody has died. Um, Hogs the House is getting close because he's at nine health. Um, the other two are at, uh, 15 and 17. Um, so then each player, assuming they only played them three cards, would redraw three cards back up to their hand of eight, and then you would start round two. Now in round two, it might be worth Hog to the House player to play a, either play something with really high initiative, or maybe play a one or two card spell to hope, um... Just to hope to get something happen. Now, if he had died, let's say he died during this game. At the beginning of the round, everyone else is refilling their hand. You draw a dead wizard card. Which dead wizard cards are going to give you various effects. She so says, at the start of my next game, I start with 3 HP. Um, so you can play it just sitting face up or you can keep it face down. It doesn't really matter. Uh, for the most part, um, some of the cards are going to have effects on them that work. Um, I just play them face up. Your opponents can see what they're coming into. So now the other two players would play their round. And let's say they get a couple little damage. Did some more damage. But neither of them died. Come down to round three. Everyone redraws their hand. Hodge the house gets another dead wizard card. Ooh, he drew another of the same one. So now he starts with six. So then now, end of the game. Princess dies this turn. Um, Zanzibar wins. He's going to get his last wizard standard, standing token. Now, if we were playing uh, with the extra tokens as well, um, it would depend on who killed who. So, let's say Princess killed, um, Zanzibar killed him, and Princess killed Hodge the House. So, now the end of, end of game one, uh, Zanzibar has two points, Princess has one, Hodge the House has zero points. Now, you can play again till play another two rounds, and score could easily change whichever way you go. But now at the beginning of the round, Hodge of the House would discard both of these. He would start with six extra health, but since he can only go up to five, he only gets five. And there's a bunch of various dead wizard cards that give other abilities, like start with a treasure, um, you're dead, nothing happens, deal two damage to a foe of your choice, um, after you're drawing your starting hand, add two additional cards. The idea is supposed to be it's the dead wizard cards, is that the longer you sit out of the game, um, you gain an advantage for the next round. So you're not starting in a complete deficit against everybody else. Um, so him starting with five extra health could, could make a big difference. It might not mean anything, because he could end up dying right off the bat. Um... The other card type we have are treasure cards. So there are various things we're going to see that give us treasure. Um, which they, they stay out until you die. Once you die, they go away. But if um, we have the Cheater's Handbook, it says when you make a power roll, you may re-roll one die. That could be very helpful. Um, or we could get something like the Punch of Powers. This counts as uh, an elemental in each of your spells. So it gives me an extra elemental glyph for all of my spells. That would have been great for Zanzibar, because he would have then had three. Um, but then when you die, they go away. Um, there are a couple exceptions to those rules, but those are the other different types of cards. Um, now we're going to take a closer look at some of the other uh, different card abilities and types. Alright, so one of the other different card types you can draw, other, other than the source, quality, or delivery, are wild magic cards. Um, which will all have this same image. Um, some versions of the game will have a little bit different text, just maybe they reworded it or added something to it. Um, but they're all going to work the same. Um, what they do is you replace this as one of your spells. So when I play my three cards down, I pick my, put my uh, magic card in there, and then when I reveal all my cards, if this was my middle, my middle card, my uh, quality, I would now search my deck, search the top of the deck, 
uh, till I find a card that would be my quality, and I add it instead. Um, and then you discard that with all the rest of the cards. And then I find a quality, so I get some random card in there. Um, the same thing if you instead have it in place of, if I put it here, I have to decide if it is my quality or if it is my source before I start looking for a card. Um, but it's a neat extra little thing you get. And there's eight in each game. Um, so you're going to get them fairly, you know, decently, but not super often. Um, there are a couple other effects and cards. There is the standee. So every game comes with um, one of these big giant standees, which represents the area that you're fighting. Like this is Skull Mountain, there's Mush Murder Shroom Marsh, the Pleasure Palace, so on and so forth. Um, some of them have extra rules associated with the standee themselves, which are mentioned in each game. Um, other times, they're just there to kind of stand around. But they will have effects on some of the cards, such as here we have Cologne Scene, um, which says choose one or either deal two damage to both each both even HP or deal three damage to each both odd HP. If you control the standee, you do both. So every time you kill a wizard, you get the standee. Um, and at the end of a round, the standee goes back into the main table until someone reclaims it. You either have to kill another wizard and steal it from them, or they have to have a card that says gain the standee. Um, and the standee can hear it, so it's showing on a quality card. It can appear on source cards. It can appear in various spots. Uh, so for instance, add one card from your hand to the spell. If you have the standee, add two cards instead. So certain uh, expansions or games will let you gain bonuses from having the standee. So it's kind of an extra little, extra little uh, effect. Um, another keyword we have in here is reaction. Um, so how reaction cards work is it says, so it's basically on there. So if you die before this card resolves, you get to do this effect. You draw two extra dead wizard cards. So if it's my turn, I'm playing my card out, I'm revealing what it does. I deal two damage to each foe who already acted this round. If my cards are still face down and somebody has killed me before I get to play my cards, I get to do my reaction effect instead. Um, and these can also appear on different parts of the cards, um, uh, or on different uh, source quality delivery. Um, they'll do different things. So it's another extra keyword that starts appearing in some of the sets. These aren't in the base game, uh, Skull Mountain, um, Skullfire Mountain, but they're in some, lots of the other sets. The other card that is in a lot of the sets are in your delivery only, which are creatures. So they're going to be illusion creature, or we could have an elemental creature. Creatures have a special ability. Uh, so you play them doing normal. So if I play dragon, I get a target foe who's already acted this round. I roll for my power, how many dice I have for how many different glyphs I have. Um, I can deal one damage, three damage, or three damage, and three damage to each foe at the last dang wizard token. And then it says keep. If you, uh, play a creature and it has the keep effect, that card stays in front of you until the next turn. And then after your spell is resolved, you have to re, uh, reactivate it again. Um, so during my next turn, if I rolled a 10, I would get to keep this dragon out. I'd play my next spell. This would count as me having an extra fire elemental out for that turn. And then I would have to re-roll for this again. As long as I kept rolling that 10 plus, you know, kept getting that keep, I would get to keep using this every turn. But if on that second round I rolled a one, um, I wouldn't keep this and it would get discarded with the rest of my cards for the turn. So, yeah, the creatures are really neat because they let you um, gain bonuses, um, do a spell at an extra time. The other thing a creature does is you have the option of when you're taking damage to have a creature absorb all of that damage. Um, so, for example, if um, my opponent hit me with a cone of acid, and it says foes on my left or right, it doesn't matter if they're going to deal 1 damage, 2 damage, or 4 damage to me. If I have my dragon out, I could choose to have my dragon take that damage instead of me, and then discard it. So having creatures stay out is very beneficial for that reason. If you ever had some reason 
where you would take multiple damage, um, they can only block the full amount. Uh, so if you had something that said deal two damage, then deal an additional two damage, they could block the first two damage, or they could block the second two damage, but they can't block both. Um, it's not from the source, it's the actual the amount of damage. Um, but yeah, creatures are really fun. They're coming in a bunch of things. And then showing like a keep can be lots of times it's on the 10 spot. Sometimes it's on the second one. Sometimes there's other effects in the game. Um, like set number two has um, as a special uh, resource type called blood. And there's at least one card that lets you pay blood to keep cards. Um, just some different stuff in here. And then like there's a target full with no creatures in play. Like you do other stuff like that. Now, this is also a neat one, too, because it says um, for how many glyphs you would want. Because if you have 10 plus, you do th more damage and you steal a treasure. But if you roll 5 to 9, you get do 2 damage and you keep your creature. So, having more glyphs in your spell might make it harder to be able to keep this creature if that's what you want to do. Um, so, those are the different uh, extra abilities and types are, again, there are other ones that come in throughout the game. Um, uh, other different things that will come out throughout the game as you find. The other thing that I don't really have, like, it's not a keyword, but it is a rule that came up later, is control. You have control of things that are playing in front of you. Um, so this includes treasures, creatures, uh, the NPDs, which are a special token type in this particular set, dead wizard cards, uh, they give you long-term bonuses. And components in your spells, you do not contr control the cards in your hand. So if something says something you control, it has to be something that is on the table in front of you, not something in your hand. Alright. And then the next thing I want to show off are on some of the treasure cards, as well as they might be on some of the dead wizard cards, is the keyword, it's in black here, everlasting. So if you die, normally you have to get rid of all of your cards you have and start fresh um, after the round ends. Everlasting lets you keep these cards. Uh, so this is very powerful. It says at the, end, at the start of each round, heal one HP for each creature you control. Uh, so then if you die, you get to have it extra. And then we have like another example. Is this still a roller's guide? So if you're the last wizard to act, deal one damage. So it's not super powerful, but it gets to stick around even after you die. Um, another interesting thing that can happen with some of the treasures uh, is they can count as creatures. So if we have from this set, which is from set number three, um, if you play this, it now counts as a creature, um, but it's going to work the same way as a creature would for your delivery spells. You have to roll each turn to try and keep it. Um, but as long as it's out, it still counts as an extra glyph as well. Um, and then with that, there are also other ways to get glyphs, such as um, dead wizard cards. This counts as a glyph, or a primal glyph for the entire next game. Um, there are also tokens from some of the other sets, um, or other things like that. It could also give you additional glyphs. Some treasure cards might give you extra glyphs, which we saw earlier. Uh, so there are ways to have potentially more than three glyphs in a set. You could have um, a dead wizard card, a creature out, and a treasure out. Um, and you could potentially have six tokens out, which for rolling power, six isn't going to really help you. But there are some cards that might say stuff like... Um, yeah, so we have something like Time Walker. Uh, time Walker Time Ranger... Each player rolls a die. Add one to your die for each different glyph in your spell. Deal three damage to the lowest rolls. So you could potentially have up to five different glyphs, um, which you basically guarantee you're going to win. Um, and there's other ones that get you more for each one. Um, like Blee Maxes, we saw earlier. We the top two cards. Each one with a glyph that matches a glyph in your spell is added to your spell. Discard the rest. So normally you can only have up to three different glyphs with this, but if you had something like this dead wizard or a treasure or a creature out you could easily have up to five different ones and have a giant spell which is super overpowered but that's the fun of the game all right then the last thing i want to show is some of the 
um, Dead Wizard cards have resolved now. Steal a living token's treasure. It remains in play till the end of this game. Um, so basically you can take someone else's thing. But when you play these, instead of waiting till the next round to get your bonus for it, these act immediately. Um, and those are a couple of keywords and things that happen in every single game. Um, Alright, so then the very last thing I would like to bring up for this uh not very quick, but this going through the explanation of how the game is played is these are sets one through five. Set one doesn't have a lot of extra keywords. Sets three, uh, three, four, five all have a uh, two, three, four, five all have extra little rules or components and stuff like that they added. Um, but set six is bound is anarchy at the arena, um, which as of this video has not been released yet. Uh, but when it comes out, I will probably have to do a follow-up video because it is going to change how the game is played at the end. They're, it's supposed to be getting rid of the Last Wizard standing tokens. And it is going to add Dead Wizard tokens, which are more like they have in the deck building game. Um, which, let me see if I can grab one for you. So they're going to add potentially something like this. I don't know if it's going to be the exact same ones or if it's going to be different ones. But they're going to have minus victory points. You're going to, I think you're still going to have last wizard standing tokens. Um, or you're going to have victory tokens, basically. Like As you win, you'll have stuff that will give you plus VP. Other things will give you minus VP. But then some of these will have effects on the back that make you do different things. Like Obviously, that doesn't work for this game. But... The idea is with six is supposed to be that you don't get eliminated and sit out. As soon as you die, you draw one of these tokens, you get a negative victory point score, um, plus some sort of bonus on the back of it. Could be an extra glyph, could let you draw a card, do something much like the dead wizard cards did. Um, but then you hop right back in the game. So rather than rather than next time you need to play, everyone starts back at full health. You might be able to come back in the next round and eliminate someone like, oh, they only have two hit, hit points left after that. You could take them out right away and gain some points, make a quick comeback. So we'll have to wait till the official rules come out for me to go through that. But that's just a heads up. They are planning on going that way with six. I don't know if that's going to be just six's rules or if that's going to be the ongoing from now on. Um... I also don't know how that means a lot of the mixing and matching lots of the sets is going to have some different rules because there's a lot of stuff that resolves it at the end of a round, um, which wouldn't work well. Um, or how do you, you know, how do your treasures work? If you, if you die, you get rid of them then everlasting. So some of them are going to be a little tricky on how that stuff works, but we'll have to just play along and see. All right. So that's what we have for this. Hope you guys enjoy it. Check out the unboxings. Check out Anile again if you want to see the deck building games. Um, I will see you guys later. Bye.